All right, welcome back to the Indie Vets Happy Hour. I am your host, Dr. Andrew Heller. I'm here with my co-host, as usual, Dr. Marissa Brunetti. Thank you for having me in your lovely home again. Thank you for being here. It's been a long time. Although I did bring the beer today. You you bring the beer a lot of the times. That's, That's kind of the trade-off is like, I provide the production support. And I have to drive here, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> you get to just sit around and oh, wait just, for me to get here. Just sitting around. <laughs> Doing nothing. Note to self <laughs> and all the listeners, I don't even pregame before Andrew gets here. I think I should. wait. I wait for you to drink a beer. So well, I do appreciate that. Why don't you tell our listeners what we're drinking today and why? All right. Well, today we have a delicious, delicious, delicious India Pale Ale called Lawson's Little Sip, and they are based in Connecticut. Ah, oh, so and why be, is Connecticut important? Yeah, well, we just launched in Connecticut. We are now open for business out there, and we are looking to bring on some great veterinarians onto our team in Connecticut. We hear a lot of veterinarians and <sighs> vet hospitals need help in Connecticut and Rhode Island. So if you are there and you want to be an indie vet, please reach out. Yeah, we are already in New England. We are in Boston. We've got a great team building there. So yes, definitely reach out if you're interested. But today is a very exciting day for this podcast. We just finished our summer series. It's a hot pet. Summer's over. But today, Marissa and I have been discussing some new topics and one that keeps coming up is this topic of vaccines, vaccinations. It's certainly something that is kind of boring, right? General practitioners, it's not like the first thing you go and learn about when you go to a CE lecture. Speak for yourself, I don't know, Andrew. Do I feel like there's so many more exciting topics. But <laughs> yeah, I mean, vaccines have been such an important part of preventive care, really forever, but forever. Now, now especially more so than ever. Why do you think this is such an important topic to you? Oh, I'm so glad you asked. <laughs> I have, what's another word for soapbox? I have a I have a large soapbox that I would like to stand on during this podcast because I love vaccinations. And I think as general practitioners, our life revolves around them and we are the experts in vaccinations for animals. And now that COVID-19 has brought immunology and vaccinations mainstream, I think it's really important to talk about this in our pets. Yeah. And we we kind of take it for granted that we just, you know, give pets many vaccines every day. But I think it's worth it to talk about not only the importance of vaccines, but the importance of a standard for our profession. And if you read my most recent blog, Let's Talk About Vaccines. It was a great one, by the way. Thank you. Um, if you read my last blog, you know that I have worked in, as you have, probably over 30 veterinary hospitals in, easy, 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 yeah. in the greater Philly area. And I'm always surprised at how different everyone's vaccination protocols are. Well, that's why you have put a really nice section on vaccination protocols in every hospital profile. Yes. Um, and surprisingly, when I look at them, they're actually different, mm -hmm. which is frustrating, but also nice to know. Yes. That we now have that information at our fingertips. But, you know, knowing all of this, we thought, here at the Indivets Happy Hour, that we should introduce a series about vaccines. And vaccines, it's bigger than one small podcast topic. And so we've broken this into at least seven different topics that you can listen to that should be 25 minutes or under mm -hmm. about vaccination. So do you want to lead us through our topics? Sure, sure. Well, today I think we're going to cover some of the organizations out there that dictate some of their guidelines for us, make it easy for yep. us to all be on the same page as, as veterinarians. We're also going to touch today on some of the vaccine reactions mm. that we see most frequently, what to do about them before they happen, what to do about them after they happen. After that, we'll talk about canine vaccination standards. We'll do some feline vaccination standards. We'll interview some reps and doctors from different vaccination companies yeah, or vaccine I'm manufacturers. About that. And then we definitely want to talk about feline injection site sarcomas, certainly an issue that could take an entire <laughs> podcast episode. And then finally, we'll top it off with a really fun one, which is sort of myths and facts about vaccines. And then as Marissa likes to call it, the vaccine grab bag. <laughs> what, what do you mean by the vaccine grab bag? Do you remember in anatomy when we were in vet school, did you guys have the bone in the bag? 
Remember, like for the for the practical, you had to reach in. We didn't and do just, it like that. Oh, you didn't. No. Just, well, that was just one part of the at practical. Penn we. At Penn, <laughs> we had a bone grab bag where you would just reach in, and you would have to say which bone it was just by feel. Ooh, I know that's not fair. <laughs> like when Why? in real life would you I, have to? No, like, I yes. agree. It's, <laughs> it's not it's fair. It's not applicable in real life, but it makes me think about grab bags. Anyway, I like that. <laughs> Anyway, there will be a bunch of topics in this grab bag. And as I said on the blog, and I'll say again here, please email us at clinical at indievets.com if you have a question or a vaccine myth or a fact that you really want to talk about. We really want to put it in the grab bag. <laughs> yes. And I'm going to make Andrew physically grab topics out of the bag. <laughs> <laughs> all right. I'll okay. get a bag. Uh, all right. So let's, let's, oh, I also wanted to talk about who this is intended for. Mm -hmm. We're veterinarians, obviously, and we hope other veterinarians listen to this and learn something. I certainly just, just researching this stuff, actually, it, it opens, you know, my eyes to some things that I probably knew but forgot. Hopefully you guys out there get something similar. But we also think vet techs. Mm -hmm. You know, you guys are the first ones to be discussing these things with the clients, most yes, likely. And yes. you're the one that's going to field a lot of the questions afterwards. And practice managers. Practice I'm sorry, managers. but we have Absolutely. had many conversations about, you know, why haven't the standards been changed in, in two decades? Oh, because we've always done it this way. Well, I think now is an excellent time to rethink your vaccine protocols, get everyone in your hospital on the same page discussing the recommendations. And this is how we're going to keep our clients from being confused and more compliant. One other thing, there are a lot of veterinarians out there that are emergency doctors. They're getting extremely burned out. They're, they're switching over to general practice. And this is actually a really good series for you guys to listen to, too, because you're going to be dealing a lot more with vaccines in general practice than you would, obviously, with emergency medicine. So Hopefully you take some advice. So really what we're saying is this episode <laughs> is the most is important for episode everyone. Ever. <laughs> <laughs> this vaccine series is really for everyone in the veterinary industry. And yes. I even think for pet owners too. I think everyone should know what's going into their pet and that we have standards and that we know what is important for them. Absolutely. All right. So let's, let's kick it off. Let's right. talk about some of the organizations that give us these guidelines. Your dog is staring at us and <laughs> making weird noises. Zach. <laughs> All right. So something you'll hear me talk about and probably have multiple times on the podcast or in real life if you know me is how upset I am that we as veterinary medicine practitioners don't have true standards. We hear people talk about AHA a lot, but you don't have to abide by AHA standards to be a practicing veterinarian. Right. To me, having certain guidelines means – that most veterinarians should be following them because they've been <laughs> scientifically proven. And obviously I understand that vaccine protocols should be tweaked for specific pets. However, the true, true guidelines should not be tweaked. We should not be making up our own guidelines. And so I really look to these three specific organizations that are both national and international to make my vaccine protocol choices. All right. So let's kick them off. What are they? So the two guidelines that you're probably most familiar with are the AHA and the AAFP guidelines. They are <laughs> updated every few years. And then one that we're looking at more frequently is WASAVA, which is the World Small Animal Vet Association. And their most recent update was in 2016. So using WASAVA, AHA, and AAFP, Together, you should be able to make a very standard protocol for your hospital and your practice. I think everybody should, if you've never looked at this, look at it and just skim through it. Believe it or not, there's a lot of really good information in there that you think you know. And when I looked through it recently, I was surprised how much I was like, oh, wow, I have totally forgot about all these things. You know, you just get so used to giving them mm -hmm. that you sometimes forget some of the science behind it and why we do certain things. It's actually really great because it gives you some great talking points with the owners, too, when they ask you why you're doing certain things. There is that in-depth, very long, complete guideline that I do recommend that every vet reads. But there are shortened versions. There are list versions. There are specific summaries that if you don't have that much time, you can absolutely read. So we will link to these three organizations in the show notes on our website. Yeah, and they've got some really great reference tables that summarize vaccine recommendations. 
There's also some algorithms outlining indications for antibody testing, as well as recommended actions for patients with a positive or negative test result. So mm. just some, some how-tos going forward as well. Wasava is another one, and they did a m- most recent update in 2016. Is there much difference between the Wasava and the AHA guidelines? No. <laughs> <laughs> what, what was interesting to me about Wasava was that they were very focused on this idea of one health. Always. And that's the idea that, you know, pets and humans, their health is interrelated. And if we keep our pets healthy, that will actually improve the health of human beings as well. And we know in history, there have been plenty of diseases that have come from animals. and Most of them, in fact. Yeah, most of them, unfortunately. Okay, so let's talk about something that terrifies a lot of people. And that is a vaccine reaction or a vaccine adverse event. What is the true definition of a vaccine adverse event? The USDA considers a vaccine adverse event to be any undesirable side effect or unintended effect, including a lack of desired result associated with the administration of a licensed biological product, aka a vaccine. Adverse events include any reaction that could compromise the health of the dog or cat, including the apparent failure to immunize. And there are a ton of different adverse events here. The most common that we see are lethargy, pain at the site, especially, some swelling. Why is my dog staring at you like this? (laughs) Dagny. (laughs) Oh my God, because it's 5'10 and she wants her dinner. So let's talk about the different type of vaccine reactions. And no, everyone, we're not going to go into type 1, type 2, type 3, reactions and hypersensitivity reactions. Yeah, don't worry. We're not going to give you nightmares about immuno. (laughs) Oh, that was my least favorite class in vet school. Same here. It was horrific. Oh, my God. All the different interleukins. (laughs) Oh, my God. Stop. Sorry. Stop. Okay. So, yeah. So, let's talk about the types. So, we've got the transient injection site reactions. We've got the sustained injection site reactions. And Mm. this could be like hair loss at the site or discoloration of the skin and things like that. You know what we mean there. Granulomas. Lumps. I always actually warn people that the rabies vaccine can sometimes leave a lump in that right rear hip area for a few weeks because I've actually had people come back within a couple of weeks and say, hey, I felt this lump. What is this? And, you know, looking back at the record, it, it's where they had a vaccine. Yeah. And we will make sure to talk about the three, two, one rule that we're all familiar with during our feline injection site sarcoma podcast. But it also applies to most lumps associated with vaccines. So the other things are some systemic adverse reactions. Some are nonspecific, like we talked about lethargy, anorexia, even fever, Mm -hmm. some lymph node enlargement. And then we start getting into the anaphylaxis, which is when we have to start treating these things. Yeah. Like I said, we're not going to talk about the types, but there are multiple allergic and immune-mediated reactions, the ones that we are very familiar with, right? The acute onset swelling around the head and ears, we can see hives. Unfortunately, we can see anaphylaxis and we can see death. Yeah. Other things that are unfortunate that we have seen are immune-mediated hemolytic anemia or thrombocytopenia. I've actually seen that. Yeah. And we can see ischemic vasculopathy. I have actually seen that on the ear tips of a Italian greyhound. That was frustrating. And of course, there are other injection site sarcoma formations that, you know, are hypersensitivity reactions. And we'll do a whole nother podcast oh, yeah. on that with cats. Yes. All right. So let's talk about ways to treat. And then I think it's interesting, after treatment, we should talk about pre-meds because who do we pre-med? We don't pre-med right. every animal. It's only animals that have had reactions in the past, typically. You don't need to pre-med every animal. Right. Exactly. Only You animals. really don't need to pre-med. Every Every animal. animal. It should be based on previous experiences. So obviously an animal comes into the emergency room, IMHA. That's a whole nother topic. We could probably do an entire podcast on that. Right. But let's talk about some of the things that we treat in general practice. Treatment is most often reserved for those hypersensitivity reactions that we see most commonly, like the swellings and the hives. And I'm going to briefly touch on anaphylaxis because I know that that terrifies all of us. But for those minor hypersensitivity reactions, most of us are using diphenhydramine at two mg per kg IM. For non-vets out there, that's Benadryl. Sorry, (laughs) Benadryl, yes. So that's your first go-to. Some people also recommend using dexamethasone at 0.2 mg per kg IV or IM. If you are seeing late phase reactions, 
you can prescribe oral steroids and oral antihistamines for the next two to three days to keep mm. your patient comfortable. And then lastly, if you see anaphylaxis, we're seeing a drop in blood pressure, we're seeing pale mucous membranes, we're seeing collapse, that usually happens pretty quickly. The way I say to people is it's usually gonna happen before the time that you're out in the parking lot leaving the clinic. And so we wanna use IV fluids and oxygen and strict patient care dexamethasone, diphenhydramine, and, and you may even need epinephrine. Mm. And so your one to 1,000 concentration, you're usually looking at like 0.1 to 0.2 mils per 10 kgs of body weight. And I like to use the VIN ER drug calculator for, for that and other ER drugs if I need them just because I'm not – an emergency clinician. <laughs> Although it's probably a good idea if you own a practice or if you work in a practice to just put up some charts for epinephrine use, you know, emergency drug use. We usually have them in, in the surgery suite. Yep. So other than what we just discussed, Andrew, are there other vaccine reactions that we can see that can be treated? Yeah. I mean, the one thing that comes to mind is oftentimes people say their pet is painful and it is okay to use NSAIDs at their normal dose. Usually I reach for carprofen. If they're healthy. If they're healthy. So if they've had a severe reaction, we, sh we should really think about not vaccinating again and doing titers, really, which maybe we can talk about in another podcast. Titers, yes. when to use. And that all depends. That totally depends. But if they've had a mild to moderate vaccine reaction or adverse reaction, I would use diphenhydramine. I would give it to them orally, most likely at home. If they forget to give it, you can give it IM or sub Q or IV. And typically we we just stick to the two mg per kg or one mg per pound dose. Yep. If you search on VIN or you talk to anyone or go to conferences, you know, giving dexamethasone or another steroid pre-vaccination is a controversial topic. And so I've I, never done it. I have done it. If you knew they had a severe reaction or a more moderate reaction, I yes. should say. Yeah. But then I guess it's like what what is our thinking about that? You know, I think we need to delve a little bit deeper into why we're doing that and pick the right treatment. But at least I would do diphenhydramine. And I've certainly been to practices where they titer everybody every year. For distemper and parvo. Yes. Because that's all you can do. Yes, exactly. <laughs> so we've covered vaccine adverse events. We've covered treatment, which is really important to me. Lastly, before we sign off, I'm going to get back on my soapbox and I'm going to say, please, please, please report your vaccine adverse events, either to the manufacturer and or the USDA. Even if you don't think it could be a vaccine adverse event, but it's close to the time that you vaccinated the animal, I think it's very important to report it. If everyone, it's like voting, yeah, right? Yeah. If everyone said, <laughs> I'm not gonna vote, then no one would vote. If one person reports an adverse event for a vaccine, but like 100 people had the same reaction, how will we know? Yeah. So please, please, please report. AHA uh -huh, actually has a PDF form. It's super easy to print out and report your adverse events, or you can do it directly to the USDA, although good luck getting a hold of them. <laughs> <laughs> but even if it's not you as the doctor, please designate someone in your practice to reporting adverse events, or at least writing them down and then reporting them every week. That well, that's a happened. good idea. That's much yeah. easier in a busy practice. Yeah. All right. Well, I think that we are just hitting the tip of the iceberg here. There's just so, the tip. Just the tip. There's so much more. <laughs> there's so much more to talk about with vaccines. And I think we did a really good job introducing the the series here. Um, I'm excited to. I'm really excited. Yeah, this is going to be really great. You to, know how I feel about vaccines. Yes. I want to give a quick shout out. I'm hoping during the series that we're going to have some indie vets on. Yeah. And they're going to bring their own local beers or other liquors. Oh, that'll be so fun. That they like. And I'm I'm very excited to have other indie vets on. So stay Well, I was excited before, that. but now that there's going to be some more local excited, beers. Yeah. <laughs> extra excited. We're going to make them mail us their local beers if we can't get them here. <laughs> oh god. <laughs> well, thanks everyone for listening. If this is your first time listening, please subscribe and leave us a review, preferably five stars if it's anything less, don't review. Even if it's not your first time and you haven't left us for a review, <laughs> you could do that too. You know what? Actually, leave us a comment of your favorite beers. That would yes. be really cool. And we could talk about them in another episode. Yeah, we would really love to hear about your favorite local beers. And thanks Cheers. for listening. Cheers. 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 <laughs>